Before I bring up Thornton Kirby, I did want to say, as I mentioned, we had a group of, of folks from a number of the, the healthcare uh, systems and, and uh, across that industry that were involved in our um, committee uh, that's been working on this issue. And we we're about collaboration, and so I think it was very telling that we had all of our major hospital systems who were involved in, and others. If you were part of that, and I know many of you were, would you just raise your hand, folks who were here? I'm not going to make you stand up, but we had eight or ten, a dozen folks who were here, and thank you all very much. If I can <laughs> it. Because it is about collaboration, and it's kind of funny that they all agree. When we started this process, we said, well, what's someone to come in and to, to give us kind of that overview of what is going on, not just in the upstate, but across the whole state and country as it comes to healthcare delivery, healthcare you know, trends, what's going on. And they all agreed within seconds, uh, Thornton, that you were the right person to come speak to. We were very fortunate to get on your calendar. So either they like you a lot or they really don't like you a lot. I'm not sure. But uh, I think it's because they respect and, and appreciate you. And so I'm very pleased uh, to bring up uh, for our keynote speaker, Thornton Kir Kirby from the South Carolina Hospital Association. Thank you, Dean. One of the reasons for that is I am very cheap. <laughs> I've been speaking a lot of places because I am willing to go and do that. And it's, a, it's really a pleasure to be invited here. And uh, particularly because the upstate of South Carolina is one of the most dynamic parts of our state. And we have a state of, of hospitals and physicians who are leading in a lot of ways and this is one of the epicenters of that so it's really an honor for you to be here so i was asked to talk about trends and i don't think you can talk about trends without talking about a starting point or a baseline i think some of the conversation going on in this country about healthcare omits a lot of the facts that most of us need to, to have a proper uh, grasp of, of the challenges in front of us so what i want to do with your permission is talk a little bit about how we got here how we develop this healthcare system in America, what its uh, strengths and weaknesses are, and where we have structural problems. That will set up a conversation about the trends because I think you'll see that the trends in our state are very much focused on improving where we have structural flaws. So uh, if we think back, the, the healthcare system in this country emerged out of the Second World War. We did not have a modern healthcare system as we think of it prior to the Second World War. We came out of a depression. There wasn't a lot of money to spend on healthcare, but there also wasn't a lot of technology or pharmacology, even if we'd had the money. We didn't discover penicillin until the late 1920s. So prior to the Second World War, there was not a lot of money in this country being spent because there was not a lot of healthcare, sophisticated healthcare being delivered. So that changed in the Second World War. We sent five million men overseas to fight in the war. We also, at the same time, had to significantly increase production in our plants of all the things that it takes to wage a war. Tanks, guns, planes, ships, everything you can think of. So there are a lot of new jobs created. Well, who's gonna take those jobs when five million workers have just gone overseas? You know about Rosie the Riveter. Many women came into the workforce at that time. But one of the things that I didn't appreciate fully was when employers began to try to fill those jobs, the first thing they, they did was to offer a salary. And when people didn't come for that salary, they started increasing the, the offered wage and the federal government became nervous. and said, well, wait a minute, we can't have runaway inflation during a wartime. So we imposed wage controls as the federal government did and said, nobody gets a raise until we say so. That's pretty heavy handed. That's, that's a lot more heavy handed than we think of today. But there was a necessity during the war. So what happened? What did employers do when they couldn't increase wages? They offered different benefits. And here comes a brand new one, health insurance. So in the Second World War, our country set out to prevent inflation. And what we got, the unintended consequence, was an employer-sponsored model for health insurance. That was not the design. We did not set a policy to develop employer-sponsored health insurance, we set a policy. The policy objective was prevent inflation during wartime, and we got out of it employer-sponsored insurance. We rocked along for 20 years until the mid-1960s, at which time we realized as a country there are some people who will not get insurance from an employer because they don't do what? Work. They don't work. If you don't work and no one in your family is working, you don't get it from an employer. So we built two programs in the 1960s 
to address people who were either out of the workforce due to retirement or who were not capable of working uh, for a variety of reasons, disabled persons, women, children. And so we built Medicare and Medicaid. And Medicare was for those retirees. Uh, we covered them from age 65 until the end of their lives. Incidentally, the average life expectancy for a man then was 67 and a half. So we're betting on two and a half years. <laughs> not the same anymore. And with Medicaid, we covered women and children. We did not cover, and we also covered disabled persons. We did not cover healthy men. I didn't know the reason for that until a couple of years ago. I found out it's because we still had a draft. And all able-bodied men serve and therefore had VA benefits for life. So the problem we saw was a short-term problem. There are women, children, and disabled persons who don't have insurance, so we built Medicaid for them. We didn't think about getting rid of the draft any more than we thought about the increased life expectancy for the Medicare population. So kind of short-term policy objectives produce a policy framework that's very interesting. So fast forward 20 more years. Now we've got an employer-sponsored model, and we've added some government insurance to it with Medicare and Medicaid, but we still have people who don't have insurance. And so we adopted another policy, this was under Ronald Reagan, and that was to say that anyone who doesn't have insurance has the right to go to an emergency room and be cared for even if they can't pay for it. That's how we rounded out our health care coverage strategy in America. That's it. Those major policy decisions over about 40 or 50 years. It doesn't necessarily work perfectly. It's not necessarily how you as a group would probably have conceived a health policy framework for a nation, but it's how we built it. Okay, so that's that's how we got the system we did. Uh, let, me, let me make a couple of comments about uh, how it compares to the systems of other nations, okay? So first of all, it has a lot less government control in it than most systems. Now, we're debating a lot of government control in healthcare, but when you compare it to most other nations, most of them are government run. So ours is less government <coughs> control, which means there's probably more of a profit motive opportunity in ours than in the ones that are strictly government operated. There's more, I would say there's more technology in the US system than in most other nations in the world. We're very heavy on having CT scanners and MRIs and all kinds of technology available in, the, in each community. We have a greater demand for specialty care, specialists, orthopedists, uh, neurosurgeons, uh, hand specialists, spine specialists, you, you name it. We tend to, to lean more towards specialty care. Most other nations lean more heavily towards <coughs> primary and preventive care. Those are just comparative features. Uh, we spend more money than any other nation by a wide margin on healthcare. Here's an interesting twist though that I want to share with you so you can take this home with you. We spend a lot more than any other nation on healthcare. We spend a lot less than the other nations on social services to address things like homelessness, mental illness, uh, welfare kinds of programs. And so other countries spend a lot more money on that than we do, and they spend correspondingly less money on health care. Because we have medicalized a lot of those problems in our society. If you have a behavioral health problem and you don't have anybody taking care of you, you can go see one of our colleagues at the emergency room. Law enforcement takes people to the emergency room. Families take people to the emergency room. People refer themselves. And the same is true with a lot of other conditions that we have put in the emergency rooms and they get blended into the cost of healthcare where other nations will put it in a different category. Now why do I share that with you? Because if you plot a different bar chart and you say when you combine health spending and social service spending, where is the United States? We are right in the middle of the developed nations. We're no longer the outlier because most nations spend a lot more on some things and less on health care. We spend more on health care and less on other things. Just something to keep in mind. Here's the one that's, that should be alarming to all of us. In a report that came out in the last 24 months, it was conducted worldwide of all the, about 17 developed nations. We as Americans have the shortest lifespan of any of those 17 nations, and we are less healthy on the way to our earlier death than any of these other nations. So how is it that we're spending more money on healthcare and not living as long, we don't have the same quality of life that other nations do? 
this is a challenge that we have to uh, engage. We can't avoid it. We have to talk about it and figure out why. So it, it leads me to a question that I've been asked a number of times. Why is, why is it so hard to fix this health care problem in our country? I personally believe it's because when you boil it down, Americans really want three things from their health care system. And they cannot be reconciled. Okay? So let me tell you what I think they are. You judge whether you agree with me. Number one, we want the best care in the world. We do not want to think care is better in Canada, or Germany, or Japan, or Mexico. We want the best care in the world. Number two, we want somebody else to pay for it. Don't send the bill to me. Send it to somebody else. And number three, we don't want to have to change our behaviors. Don't tell me I have to ride a motorcycle with a helmet. Don't tell me I can't drink a big gulf in New York City. Don't tell me I can't smoke. I have rights. I'm an American. So those three things, if you build the system to optimize for those three things, the very best care that you don't have to pay for, somebody else pays for it, and you can behave how you want and be as unhealthy as you want, you're gonna get a weird system that has perverse incentives in it like ours does. So what was ours not built to do? Well, we're frustrated with it because it was not because it's not doing some things we wish it would do, but I would submit to you that it wasn't built to do these things. It was built to address acute illnesses regardless of the cost. If you have a, a fracture, if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke, we are among the best in the world at fast interventions and taking care of it. Is, it was not built to do a couple of things. Frank, you want a bottle of water? There's a bottle up here. Um, sure. Sure. Um, glad to be of service. That's the healthcare system working. <laughs> Keeping people healthy. So what was it not built to do? It was not built to, to promote good health. It was to promote, or it was to built to treat illness, not to keep people healthy, but to address sickness and, and injury. Uh, it was not built to control costs. That wasn't its design. We can say what we want about other nations' models, but many of them were built much more to keep costs down. That's why they focus heavily on prevention and primary care. We don't have such an emphasis compared to them. Another thing it was not built to do is encourage cooperation between competitors. Our Justice Department, our, our judicial system, looks askance at that. Greenville and uh, St. Francis here in town it is a big no-no for them to get together and talk about, hey, you do these services and we'll do these. That keeps the cost down for the community. Bad, bad news for the Justice Department. They will have a quick meeting uh, with the leadership of these hospitals. So our laws were not built to promote some things we want, which are good health, low cost, and collaboration and cooperation among competitors. So that suggests to me uh, that we have some structural problems. There are probably a lot more that you could articulate, but I'm going to give you five things that I think are fundamental structural problems of our healthcare system today. The, the number one that is on everyone's mind is affordability. <clears throat> Let me give you a bullet point. Rather than rattling off a lot of data about that, I'm going to give you two data points that I think tell this story. The average median income for family in the United States is $52,000 this year. Average median income, $52,000. The average premium for a family for health insurance is $17,000. So if you were making $52,000 before taxes, would you spend $17,000 of your money to buy a health insurance policy? The fact of the matter is, health insurance is not affordable for the average American family. That is a problem. That's why government is buying it and employers are buying it. And as the costs go up, that's why employers and government are saying, no more. We can't do this anymore. So affordability, big problem. Another big problem is access. Despite all the efforts to cover more of the uninsured and the Affordable Care Act and all that, we still have uh, tens of millions of people in this country who don't have insurance. And the data are clear. If you do not have insurance, you do not interact with the healthcare system in the same way as a person who does have insurance. You're less likely to seek care early, which means you're going to be sicker when you do. Uh, you don't have the same kind of relationship with a physician who can manage your care over time. There are a lot of uh, reasons that access is a structural problem in our system. Whether or not 
Remember, we've said in our system, we're not gonna give you free primary preventive care, but we will take care of you when you get really sick and come to the emergency room. So forget altruism for a minute, just think budget. If you're trying not to spend more money than you need to on healthcare, you wanna intervene on the earliest end possible. Don't wait until it's really bad. But that's how we have built our system. So it's structural, structurally well. Reliability, that the reliability of our healthcare system is still not what we want it to be. And by that I mean, do we make mistakes? Is it safe enough? It is not as reliable as commercial aviation. It's not as reliable as nuclear power generation. We have to do a better job of preventing harm to patients and delivering the right care every time. This is one of the areas that I'm really passionate about because our hospitals are so committed to getting it right for patients. We are among the leaders in the country. Uh, we are consistently among the top <coughs> states in the nation in terms of the quality of hospital care. We keep driving that forward. But until we get to the point we don't harm patients, they don't get infections, they don't have falls in the hospital, we have not achieved what we need to achieve. Behavioral health. This is a big, big structural problem in our country. There are a lot of people who have mental illnesses, substance abuse problems, and we as a nation have not embraced that. We would prefer, we have stigmatized it too often. Uh, about a decade and a half ago, we decided that we should not put people in institutions when they have mental illness. We should treat them in the community level. We were very successful at defunding the institutions we were not as successful at building community-based services. So a whole lot of people in this country who have chronic problems and are very high cost to the system have behavioral health issues that keep them from managing their health successfully. Uh, there are a lot of comorbidities. When you see uh, people who have a lot of different problems, obesity and diabetes and other issues or often have uh, behavioral health problems and their smokers or other um, substance abuse, substance abusers, those things tend to go together in a collection and they become, they make those patients very hard to control and manage and very expensive for the rest of us to absorb. So behavioral health is one of the areas that we have to get more realistic about. Uh, rural health care, here's another one I would tell you. Structurally, our rural health infrastructure in many communities is crumbling. It was built after the Second World War in the 60s and 70s, the federal government encouraged the, the, the construction of hospitals all over the country, and they were built, and it, made, it brought hospital care much closer to the average American. But many of those communities have not had the resources to reinvest and replace that, that capital plant, physical plant, and so now they are 50, 40, 50, 60 years old, and they're just not in a place, a, a, a place that is relevant, they're, they're becoming obsolete right in front of our eyes. So those are some structural problems I think that we have to deal with. Now, if that's the backdrop, if that's the, the environment, what are the trends? What are the, the positive trends? Some you may not conclude are necessarily as positive as others, but some definitely are. The first trend I'll tell you about is in quality of patient care. Because <coughs> nothing is more fundamental to what we want from our healthcare system than to know we get the right care for ourselves and our loved ones every time. That is a place, as I noted earlier, where South Carolina is leading the nation, the collaboration in this state, first among hospitals, and then later with business leaders, Blue Cross Blue Shield, research universities, free clinics, federally qualified health centers. Many different partners are working together to ensure that we get the right care to patients um, every time. We are one of, among the best in the country in heart attack care timeliness of heart attack care. We're among the best in the country in preventing hospital infections, and we're leading uh, in some of this, the efforts to make surgical, uh, surgical care even safer. So there are some great things we're doing as a state. Health status is improving. Dean put up here on the list that we are 42nd in health rankings. That's up from 46th a couple of years ago. We typically have been in the bottom five, so to be 42nd is a step in the right direction. There's a lot of collaboration in this state that's really encouraging around the idea of driving that health status even higher. No single sector, no single industry, no single organization can drive health status in this state. We all have to do it together. And there are about 46 or seven organizations that have committed to doing that and have been working at it for several years. And it's 
a mix of state agencies and business leaders and insurance and physicians and, and hospitals. That is extremely encouraging. Uh, the reason we've come up in our rankings is because we have addressed infant mortality. And we're going to continue focusing on maternal child care and on behavioral health and on several other topics that will drive that statewide ranking. So that's, you should be encouraged about that. There are in this state over the last 10 years fewer and fewer independent physicians. It is becoming much harder for physicians to practice independently. The cost of malpractice insurance, the challenges of uh, owning and managing an office, running a staff, managing call for your patients in the emergency department, going back and forth to the hospital, all these things are becoming very difficult for physicians. And they are seeking security, I guess, from a business standpoint, in larger groups of physicians, often with hospitals. So I'd say now about two thirds of the physicians in this state are employed by hospitals. And that is uh, a trend that is mirrored by the fact there are fewer and fewer independent hospitals. More and more of the hospitals that are sole independent hospitals are finding themselves struggling to make it in a tighter and tighter and more competitive environment where the reimbursements are being ratcheted down because of the concerns about cost. And so they're finding new partners and affiliations. So in the upstate, you have seen uh, a number of physicians that have become employed by hospitals. And then you've seen some hospitals that have become part of systems. And that aggregation or alignment into larger business organizations is going to continue. Those are national trends. Wall Street favors larger business organizations because they perceive they have more stability and more likelihood of success. So whether you're an, uh, an investor-owned system like Healthcare Corporation of America, HCA, or whether you are a not-for-profit, uh, when you're trying to get Wall Street's money, they're going to be they're going to prefer larger business units. So we're going to see that trend continue. The payment systems are being reformed and refined. One of the big trends out of the Affordable Care Act is we should, we should change what we value or pay for in our healthcare system. We have long paid for what we, what we refer to as volume, the number of procedures done. So the more procedures you do, the more you get paid. And the idea is we really ought to begin paying for how well the healthcare system manages a patient's health. So give them the money up front, tell them to manage it, and give them a, a, a financial incentive not to do more, but to do only the right amount, because there's no uh, profit in doing more than is necessary. So we, we've seen some steps in reforming the payment system. We're going to see a whole lot more in the next five or 10 years. More hospitals and physicians are focusing on health. I told you that our system is not built toward health, it's built toward sickness, but a lot more, particularly in your community, in this upstate region, you're seeing a lot more of our leaders focused on the health of patients. Uh, a lot more care is being delivered on an outpatient basis. That is a, a positive trend in many ways. Uh, things that used to require long hospitalizations are now requiring short hospitalizations. The things that used to require short are now being done outside the hospital and the technological advances are going to continue to move that trend away from inpatient care. Uh, of course, there'll always be certain things that require hospitalization, but more and more can be done outside. So all those things taken together suggest change, and when you wrap them into a total package, there is a lot of change going on, and with that change comes uncertainty. Now, where is the uncertainty coming from? Well, anytime you take a lot of different aspects of your business model and put them in play all at once, it's uncertain how it's going to play out. But we also have external factors that are driving uncertainty. One is the future of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Physicians and hospitals are trying to reorient their business to prepare, as well as insurance companies, prepare for the requirements of the law. But they also have one eye on Congress and asking the question, is this thing really going to stay? Or is it, you keep talking about repealing it. Are you really going to repeal it? If you're going to repeal it, tell me, because I'm not going to turn my whole business model only to find out that you're going to undo it. Another one is the Supreme Court's uh, ruling in the premium subsidy case that's expected later this month. That could upend a lot of the way states cover uh, their, their, uh, their uh, citizens with health insurance. 
So those are some of the sources. Let me uh, just say, leave you with a couple of thoughts. Why should you be optimistic about the future of healthcare? Number one, because your leaders in this state are not only focused on the quality of care and driving it to new levels, they are successful at it. They're very good at it. And they're being recognized more and more nationally. I'm honored I get to do this kind of talk all over the country because people want to know what's going on in South Carolina. And it's a pleasure to be able to talk about that. Uh, another reason we are optimistic is because it's not every generation that has the opportunity to reshape something as fundamental as our healthcare system. And there are some people in healthcare who are tired and shaking their head and saying, I just can't, I, I want to retire, I don't want to deal with this. But the vast majority, I think, are on one level energized by the opportunity to do a better job for our patients and our country by the way we structure it. And then uh, the final thing is, as I said before, our business and government and healthcare leaders in this state are working together to drive health status and a better healthcare system for all people in the state. And you can see it right here in the upstate. So with that, I don't want to go over time. Dean, you want to come on back up? And I'll either take questions if you want or I'll give it back to you, Dean.